Okay, we can start our um, seminar today. So as a representative of very European country, Uzbekistan, <laughs> I'm glad to present our uh, speaker today, uh, Adela Latore. Uh, she'll be talking about soluble Lie algebras with complex symplectic structures. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation to speak in this nice seminar. Uh, the aim of this talk is to present some results obtained in different papers with, uh, in collaboration with Giovanni Bazzoni, Marco Freiberg, Alejandro Gil Garcia, Benedict Meinke, and Nicoletta Dardini. And all of them, they, I mean, all our papers, they deal with a specific type of geometric structures called complex symplectic structures. So I should say that even if the motivation of these works is to find new geometric structures on smooth manifolds, to be exact, uh, and the kind of manifolds we work with are strongly related to solvable the algebras and indeed, as we will see in a few minutes, uh, it will be enough to find these complex symplectic structures on solvable Lie algebras to find these kind of structures on the corresponding uh, smooth manifolds that we will call soft manifolds in particular. So, um, I don't know. Okay, now. Uh, so the talk will be divided into four parts. First, I will explain in detail this motivation. Um, I will explain a little bit of geometry so that you can all understand the problem and why it, in it is interesting to me. And then I will define specifically what this complex symplectic structure structures on Lie algebras are. And I will study in detail the four-dimensional case. I mean, the case where when the Lie algebra has dimension four and how we construct this complex symplectic structures on this specific case. And well, at the techniques used in the four-dimensional case cannot be transferred to higher dimensions. I will then explain two different methods to construct these complex symplectic structures on not necessarily, not necessarily four dimensions four dimensions. I mean, the, these methods are applied in any, any other dimension. So, oops. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so let me start with some geometry. So I'm going to start with from the very beginning so that we can all understand the problem and see how algebra enters in this kind of geometric constructions. So, uh, I think we all studied this notion of a smooth manifold in our, in our undergraduate studies. So we start with a smooth manifold, so dimension n, which is a topological space satisfying some topological conditions. I will not talk about them. But the key point in this definition is that this topological space has two special properties. The first one is that for every point in our space, we can find an open set and uh, homeomorphism that sends this open, open set that contains the point to some open set of Rn. And the second condition that the smooth manifold satisfies is that if we have another open set that intersects the previous one with a different homeomorphism that takes this open set to Rn, then in the intersection of these two open sets, when we see this intersection in Rn, then these maps here, which go from Rn to Rn, are the diffeomorphisms. So this is the definition of a smooth manifold that we have all studied, I think. So, uh, what's the key point about the previous slide? The key point is that uh, the definition of a smooth manifold is something local. I mean, we go to um, open sets, 
And then we look at this open set, small pieces of our manifold, and then we send these small pieces to something in Rn, but still they are small pieces of Rn. But if we want to define geometric structures, these geometric structures, obviously they are something global. So we need a tool to go from something local to something global. And usually this tool in geometry has to do with bundles. In particular, when usually it deals with either the tangent bundle or the ecotangent bundle. For the things I'm going to explain next, I will just focus on the tangent bundle. Recall that the tangent bundle is just the union of the tangent spaces at each point of the manifold. So we think of the manifold, we think about one of these points and tangent is based at each point. But in this space, as you can guess, there are many vectors and uh, we have to, okay, we have this space, which is essentially Rn because we are thinking about n-dimensional manifolds. We have a wide collection of vectors. And what we do is to select one, one vector from this tangent space on its point of our manifold. And this gives us a section of this tangent bundle. But we don't want, as we are dealing with the differential geometry, things are smooth. So this choice cannot be arbitrary in general. I mean, we want that this choice is a smooth, that I mean, that it varies smoothly as we move around the manifold. So in this sense, we are interested in the space of the smooth vector fields on the manifold, which are these sections I've talked about, but in such a way that they are smooth. And many, many geometric structures on manifolds are indeed defined on this space of the smooth vector fields, which is, let's say, our tool to see um, our manifold globally. The drawback of it is that the, its dimension can be infinite, so it can be difficult to deal with. So uh, just to keep in mind this idea, let us recall the notion of a Riemannian metric that we all have in mind, right? So one can think of a Riemannian metric uh, on a smooth manifold as a tensor, essentially, that takes uh, from two copies of this space of the smooth vector fields to the set of smooth function of our manifold. But in such a way that this map here satisfies like three, three properties that we like. Uh, it is bilinear, it is symmetric, and it is positive definite. In particular, if we fix one point of the manifold, this Riemannian metric gives us an inner product on each tangent space of the manifold. So I can see here a little bit of algebra. And as I said, defining geometric structures is not always easy, but for instance, in the case of Riemannian metric, we have this nice result that says that every smooth manifold has a Riemannian metric. So we have like a big assistant result, even though defining this space is not always easy. Nonetheless, one should keep in mind that things get more complicated when one taking into account curvature. At least we have this nice existent results. However, for other geometric structures, things are not so straightforward. And I'm going to focus on complex structures because they will be related to this complex symplectic structures I want to define later. So to define a complex structure, first we need to consider an almost complex structure, which is just an endomorphism on the space of the smooth vector fields that satisfies this identity here. Let's say that an almost complex structure is something that's somehow imitating the imaginary unit of the complex numbers. Uh, so an endomorphism like this is just an almost complex structure. To have a complex structure, we need that this endomorphism here satisfies this extra condition, which is the vanishing of the so-called Nijenhuis tensor, which is given in terms of the Lie bracket and the, this almost complex structure in this way. 
as you can see on the screen. And when these two conditions are satisfied, namely p square equals minus identity plus the vanishing of an identity tensor, which is also called integrability condition, then this GA is called a complex structure. As I said before, the difference between complex structures and Riemannian metric is that complex structures do not always exist. Indeed, not every smooth manifold has an almost complex structure in a complex structure. For instance, the first reason is that um, to have an almost complex structure, we need that the real dimension of the manifold is even. But even if we have an even dimensional real manifold, um, almost complex structures do not necessarily exist. For instance, if we, if we think about even dimensional spheres, just the two sphere and the six sphere admit almost complex structures. So uh, the four, four sphere, eight sphere and so on, they do not admit almost complex structures. And even among these two structures, these two spheres that do have almost complex structures, it is known that uh, the two sphere has complex structure. I mean, the, the almost complex structure one can construct on the two sphere is integral, but the almost complex structures that have been found on the six sphere, they are not integrable. So it is still an open problem if the six sphere admits a complex structure or it doesn't admit a complex structure. So this is an example of how things get complicated, for instance, for complex structures. Uh, but let me say a few words about complex structures because they will be one of the main tools of this talk. Uh, uh, the interest, let's say, in complex structures comes because they are a link between smooth manifolds and complex manifolds. Uh, a complex manifold can be defined in a similar way to a smooth manifold, but just replacing Rm by Cn and then as we are moving between CN and CN, as you can guess, the change of charge are not just diffeomorphism, but holomorphism, biolomorphism. Right? So if we have a complex manifold, it turns out that the same topological space has the structure of a smooth manifold. But if we want to go back, I mean, if we want to decide whether a smooth manifold of dimension to end admits the structure of a complex manifold, this is not a straightforward. Because first we need to construct an almost complex structure on it. And once we have this almost complex structure, uh, we need to apply this new land of Niederman theorem. This theorem says that as long as the uh, Nijenquist tensor vanishes for every pair of smooth vector fields, then this pair given by the manifold and the almost complex structure, which is now complex, is indeed a complex manifold. Uh, to get a general idea, this theorem tells us that if we have this almost complex structure satisfying the Nijenquist condition, then we are able, let's say, to combine the uh, real charts to build holomorphic charts. And well, this solves the problem as you can guess from the case of the six sphere, it's not an easy problem. I mean, to apply this theorem for specific examples. So we have said that it's not easy to construct geometric structures because we need to take into account this space of smooth vector fields. But there are some cases, then some special manifolds where the problem can be slightly simplified. And so manifolds are one of those, these cases. Because a soul manifold is defined as a quotient of a connected, simply connected solvable group by a discrete subgroup, which makes this quotient compact. This is what we call a lattice, right? And 
you want to have uh, an example in mind, this would be an, an easy one, let's say. We can see that the, this set, which is given by upper triangular matrices with ones in the diagonal and this three element in R. One can easily check that G is a group because it is a group, it is a smooth manifold in it, it has a global chart given by this map. And one can check that the product and the inverse of matrices in G are uh, smooth functions. Moreover, this set is connected and simply connected because it is essentially like R3. And if one computes its Lie algebra, which is actually the three-dimensional Heisenberg algebra, one can check that the Lie algebra is nilpotent, so it's solvable. And this makes that our Lie group is a solvable Lie group, in fact, an impotent Lie group. So to define a compact quotient, we simply take the same set, but with the end, these three entries in set instead of in R. And then this quotient gives us a manifold, which is indeed that the manifold because the group is important. Okay. So what's good about solve manifolds is that when we, we can, obviously we can consider the space of a smooth vector fields on these of manifolds and construct their complex structures. But this is usually difficult, as I said before. But we can focus on a special kind of complex structures that are called invariant. These invariant complex structures are, are complex structures which can be defined on the Lie algebra G of the Lie group G. So, the idea is that we, we consider the Lie algebra of the Lie group, which is isomorphic to some tangent space. We define this complex structure on this tangent space, I mean on the Lie algebra, and then by left translations, we move it all around the Lie group. So one can use this local thing, which is the Lie algebra, to construct something global. The good point about the Lie algebra is that it is finite dimensional in contrast with the set of left in, bar, in, in contrast with this set of smooth vector fields on the manifold. It can be infinite dimensional. And another good point about this invariant complex structures is that if we want to construct a certain geometric structure related to this invariant complex structure, one can do it at the Lie algebra level. In fact, for instance, if we have our solved manifold with the invariant complex structure, and we are able to find a certain geometric structure of the Lie algebra, this automatically gives you, most of the cases, uh, an analogous uh, geometric structure on the solved manifold. And uh, this is even stronger because sometimes you can detect the existence of uh, geometric structures just at the level of the Lie algebra. So sometimes if you are able to do your construction of the Lie algebra, that's enough. Sometimes, not always, but let's say that the Lie algebra is working at the Lie algebra is quite nice. And that's why mm, we uh, many different. times... Can I, ask one, one, can I ask one quick, quick question? So yeah, sure. I, I still don't understand what is the uh, uh, what is the essence of gamma. I mean, you see, I understand when you have a structure on on Lie algebra, right? you can extend it on the on the big Lie group, right? Mm -hmm. But what is the what is the, what is the essence of of gamma here? Oh, uh, essentially, it's just for the to make the quotient compact. Ah, I see. Yeah, actually, you can define just the structure on the Lie group. If you don't uh -huh. care about compactness, you can just do that on the Lie algebra and then go to the Lie group, and that's yeah. all. But yeah, yeah. sometimes in geometry, people like we like <laughs> compact things, so that's why we need the the lattice. Uh, I don't know. This is hmm? yeah. In many cases, you can prove that your manifold, every such manifold, arises as a quotient of this type. So this is the important thing mostly. 
Yeah, so say for Euclidean Riemannian manifold or F finitely flat manifold, they're exactly of this type with some discrete co-compact subgroup. I mean the compact ones. So it makes sense to to look at this. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So in the end, many times we directly look at the Lie algebra and then deconstruction of, on it. And well, as we were talking about the problem is the system of lattices. If you want to construct something compact, let's see. In the case of the nil potent groups, this is solved. Oh, pardon me? No, I, okay. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the group is nil potent, we have this results by Malsev. That tells us that if you have a nilpotently algebra where the uh, for which you can find a basis where the structure constants are rational, then this warranties the existence of lattice. So in an important case, many times we don't care much about the lattices. However, if uh, the link group is soluble but not nilpotent, and there's no general theory about lattices. I mean, there are only some partial results. For instance, there is an obstruction because if you have, if a lattice exists, then your Lie algebra must be unimodular. At least we have an obstru obstruction. And, but also there are some um, existent results on some classes of Lie algebra such as almost abelian. But, Nonetheless, I, I would say that in the solvable case, like looking for appropriate lattices, it's kind of a, a line of research. I mean, there are people looking for appropriate lattices to make this compact portion. So it's not so straightforward as in the nilpotent case. At any case, we are in the non-associative algebra seminar. So I will not care about lattices and think about constructing these geometric structures on the Lie algebras, in particular on solvable Lie algebra. So let me explain what is a complex symplectic structure. So as I said, I just consider the Lie algebra case. So G uh, would be our two n dimensional real Lie algebra. And we put on G, two different geometric structures. The first one is a complex structure, which is defined as a so before. Essentially, it is an endomorphism of the Lie algebra satisfying two conditions. It's a square equals minus identity, and this Nikenquist tensor vanishes for every pair of vectors I take in the Lie algebra. And the second structure is a symplectic form. This is a two form. Uh, that is closed and it is non degenerate. Well, uh, initially, these two structures are unrelated. Mm, there's no uh, relation between them. But if we want to construct a complex symplectic structure, we have to make them interact. And the interac interaction comes uh, by this expression here. Uh, we will say that a pair given by a complex structure and a symplectic structure is a complex symplectic structure if the complex structure is symmetric with respect to the symplectic structure. Observe that this is equivalent to this condition here. If we plug the complex structure and the two components of the, on the form, we get like a minus sign outside. I mean, the complex structure disappears inside and you get a minus sign. So when this condition hold, we will say that J and omega gives you a complex symplectic structure. And some observations about this process. The first one is that our complex structure induces a big graduation in the space of complex form. Okay, we have the fine complex structure at the level of the Lie algebra, but we can equivalently define this complex structure on the dual, just simply applying this, this formula here. But then if we complexify this space, 
it turns out that the complex structure splits this space into two eigenspaces. We call it one zero to the one associated with the plus the imaginary unit and zero one to the eigenspace corresponding to minus the imaginary unit. And as you can guess, these spaces are conjugate to each other. But okay, we have this big graduation for one forms, but it moves to any K form. So if you have a complex K form, it can be split into smaller pieces as long as this P plus Q equals the, the, the degree of the initial form. Say. So for K equals one, we have the one zero and zero one we have here. But if you think about the two forms, complex two forms, I would say, then the splitting gives you two zero forms, one one forms and zero two forms and so on with the rest of the grades. Uh, the, the case of two forms is interesting because we had a symplectic form. And if we think about the, our symplectic form and we apply this J star to it, then we get the minus sign here, which essentially this, is, this formula, this equality here tells us that our symplectic form, when we see it in terms of this big graduation, is of type two zero plus zero two, and it is real. Okay, so indeed, if we have a complex symplectic structure on the Lie algebra, one can construct a complex two form of it in this way, just using the real form, plugging the complex structure here, using the imaginary unit, and then this is a two zero form with respect to the the graduation is used by the complex structure, which is closed and it is non degenerate. So, indeed, there is an equivalent description of complex symplectic structures, and we can either see them as pairs of complex, complex structure, symplectic structure, with satisfying this symmetry condition, or we can see them as pairs of complex structure and these two zero form with respect to the big graduation by J. So this is a, the two way, let's say, if I have the real one, I can construct the complex one, but if I have the complex one, I can recover the real one. So this is in one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, the good point about this complex point of view is that the non degeneration of this form implies that the real dimension of the algebra has to be a multiple of four. And well, we address the problem of classification, these complex symplectic structures only. And of course, we will call complex symplectic Lie algebra to a triple this form, where these two structures satisfy the condition I told you. So what do we know? Well, dimension four is completely understood because if we have a four-dimensional Lie algebra, not necessarily solvable, not necessarily important, we have this result that says that the existence of a symplectic structure on this four-dimensional Lie algebra implies that the Lie algebra has to be solvable. So if we want to study complex symplectic Lie algebras, it's sufficient to study them on solvable Lie algebras. But there is a lot known on four-dimensional solvable Lie algebras. Indeed, we have a full classification uh, of the Lie algebras, the solvable Lie algebras, 4D. Uh, we also have a classification of complex structures on them. And independently, we have we, we know perfectly which ones admit symplectic structures. So we have, let's say, a list of candidate, candidates for having complex symplectic structures. Uh, I'm going to show a table, but let me say a few words about the annotation I'm using. Because I usually denote, I will denote the Lie algebra as tuples like this. In this case, if I have a four-dimensional tuple, this means that the Lie algebra has dimension four. So the differential 
of the first element of the basis equals zero, the differential of the second one equals zero, the differential of the third one would be minus the wedge product of the first and the second, and so on. If you prefer, so this gives the differential, the structure equations. If you prefer the brackets, let's simply use the usual formula, right? So this is, if um, crossing all the previous results, we have like our list of candidates because these are the unique four dimensional solvable Lie algebras that simultaneously admit a complex structure and a symplectic structure. So once you have this list, you need simply to check the, the condition. The, you need to discover whether there is some symplectic structure with respect to which the complex structure is symmetric. So one does the calculations and we realize that there are only four having these complex symplectic structures. Indeed, observe that for instance, this algebra has a family of non-isomorphic complex structures, but just one of them admits a nice symplectic structure. And for instance, this other family, which is an infinite family, only admit that complex symplectic structure for this specific value of the parameters. So in the end, if we make use of this, of the equivalent, the notion of equivalence of complex symplectic structure, where we say that two complex, two complex symplectic algebras are equivalent if and only if there exists an isomorphism of algebras that preserves the complex structure and preserve the symplectic form, we are able to prove that uh, the, the set of complex symplectic structures up to equivalence are just this, this ones. Right? So as you can see, there's just one complex symplectic structure up to equivalence on R4, one up to equivalence in this algebra, one up to equivalence in this one, but this one here is the first one that admits like a different non-isomorphic, non-equivalent complex symplectic structures. So, uh, well, I will skip a lot of lattices, but so just- the last key, So the last key is actually, uh, it's, a, it's a family of uh, symplectic structures, right? I mean, it's parameterized yeah. by P1, right? Mm. Yeah, right. There's a- mm. uh, Okay, the complex structure is fixed. We only have one, but yeah, yeah. for that one, you have different symplectic mm -hmm. structures. Yeah. Right. I see. Okay, thank you. And yeah, about lattices, I would say that mm, are, these two are nilpotent, so they admit lattices, and the rest are not uh, unimodular, so they are not compact Gaussians. Right. Anyway. The key point is that in dimension four, seeing we have the classification of algebras, we have the classification of complex structures, and we know which Lie algebras admit symplectic structures, we could, mm, let's say, complete the picture. However, uh, if we want to go to higher dimensions, this is not so easy because even in the nilpotent case, there is no classification of eight dimensional. Lie algebras, even in the nilpotent case, which is supposed to be the easy case. So we have to develop a new approach, indeed new approaches that allow us to construct the triples all at the same time. Let's say to construct simultaneously the the algebra, the complex structure, and the symplectic structure. Admit having this, let's say, compatibility condition between them. So. The first method is what we call complex symplectic reduction and oxidation. Uh, actually, this method is based on the symplectic reduction and oxidation developed by Bowes and Cortez that I will briefly present it here so that you can see the main difference with the complex symplectic case. So if we start with the algebra with a symplectic form, 
at this point, no complex structure at all. We take an ideal and we consider the symplectic orthogonal. And well, the symplectic orthogonal is not an ideal, it's just a subalgebra. But if we suppose that the ideal is isotropic, meaning that uh, we take any two elements of the ideal and we plug them on the symplectic form, the form vanishes, then the ideal is contained in this symplectic orthogonal and we can perform this symplectic reduction. Because the, the initial symplectic form we had above, this sends to a symplectic form on this quotient the algebra. And then this pair, uh, G bar, omega bar, is called a symplectic reduction of G omega with respect to the ideal A. Please bear in mind that this ideal should be isotropic. So to perform this symplectic reduction, you need an, iso an isotropic ideal. If it does not exist, then you cannot do this procedure. And mm, we have a Lie algebra, we go down, we found another uh, symplectic Lie algebra. So to go up again, this is called uh, symplectic oxidation. And well, the symplectic oxidation in this symplectic case is developed for this special case where the, the ideal we take is one dimensional and it is central. And in this case, it coincides with the double extension by Medinator. Okay, so this is for the symplectic case. What we did was adapted, was adapting this symplectic reduction and oxidation to the complex symplectic case. So now, instead of just having our Lie algebra with complex with symplectic structure, we additionally have this complex structure in such a way that these two geometric structures give you a complex symplectic structure. The procedure is similar. Let's say we take an ideal, the symplectic orthogonal. Again, we need the ideal to be isotropic, but as we need to take into account the complex structure, the ideal should must also be G invariant. Let's say the image of the ideal under the complex structure is again in the in the ideal. And when such an ideal exists, the complex symplectic structure descends to the quotient. And this is called the complex symplectic reduction. With respect to this ideal, it should be not only isotropic, but also G invariant. But to do the reverse process in the same way that Bauer's Arcotest needed this one dimensional central ideal, we now need this two dimensional central ideal. Two comes because of the J invariant condition. So, uh, so that these two processes coincide and need them, we can reduce and then oxidate. We need to study in detail the reduction process with respect to this specific uh, idea. So uh, we start from uh, 4n plus 4 dimensional real Lie algebra, admitting a complex symplectic structure. The first observation is that we take a two-dimensional gene environment ideal, continue the center. Uh, the fact that A is two-dimensional and J invariant automatically gives the isotropy condition, which is good. Then we need the central condition in the same way that Bowers and Cortez needed the central condition to be sure that this space here is an ideal. And then we can mimic the, the Bowers and Cortez construction to find our quotient Lie algebra with a symplectic structure and the new, let's say, uh, we, the new structure is this complex structure, which is defined in the natural way on the quotient. But then we can identify this G bar with the complement of A inside the symplectic orthogonal, then this induced symplectic structure is just the, the restriction of the initial symplectic structure in this space. And the same happens for the complex structure. So then if we 
pay attention to this process, we realize that the remaining parts uh, to complete this Lie algebra from this other Lie algebra are simply this space, which is the, the, the complement of the simplicity orthogonal instead of the Lie algebra. We can ask it to be orthogonal to this space. And then we can identify the, the ideal A with this B star. And these data give the key to invert the complex symplectic reduction. Because if we now start from a foreign dimensional Lie algebra with complex symplectic structure, we need to add to it two spaces. One is V, which should be a two dimensional real vector space admitting an almost complex structure. It's dual. And in such a way that V would play the role of this, this part, V bar would play the role of this, and so on. So on this vector space, we put this, we uh, define this non-degenerative form. We define this almost complex structure. And one can check that J is symmetric uh, with respect to the, this omega, but this is just something mm, done at the level of vector spaces. So the next step is to put a Lie bracket on the Lie algebra and to ensure that omega is closed and the vanishing of the Nyquist tension for the almost complex structure. So uh, keeping in mind that V star plays the role of this central ideal and that these conditions should hold, one has uh, uh, a way of defining the brackets. But obviously, from here, one needs to impose the Jacobi identity because we want a Lie algebra, the closeness of omega, and then I think we Spanish. And imposing these conditions, one gets some technical conditions on this uh, maps here. And one realizes that the essential data is given by uh, the terms in blue, I mean tau, f, and not even J, but the symmetric part of it. I'm not showing the technical conditions because they are very technical, let's say, but uh, at least I hope you get an idea. And one can check that this oxidation and reduction procedures agree, I mean. And indeed, one can check that uh, to get an important Lie algebra, one has to start from an important Lie algebra and construct F in such a way that the associative matrix is enabled. So using this, this procedure, we have applied it for nilpotent Lie algebras, in particular to the A-dimensional case. So to do so, the first thing I need to keep in mind is that when we apply uh, this procedure of oxidation to find a complex symplectic Lie algebra, uh, the Lie algebra we obtain is of a very specific type. I mean, the, the triple we obtain uh, has to satisfy this condition here. So the, this condition means that the center of your Lie algebra uh, has a J-invariant subspace inside. But when we are in the case of nilpotent Lie algebras, this, this, is, this not happens always. Indeed, when we are dealing with nilpotent Lie algebras, there are two kinds of complex structures on them. One of them are called strong needle nilpotent, which has precisely those for which there is no G-invariant subspace in the center, and the other ones are called quasi nilpotent and for them, you can actually find this J invariant subspace in the center. So to apply the construction for the eight-dimensional case, the potent eight-dimensional case, what we realize is that our oxidation process were only, only giving us those triples with J of this specific type. 
And indeed, we compute all the oxidation that data to get all these triples, uh, starting from the four-dimensional classification, four-dimensional nipotent classification. And for the remaining case, we use the classification. Uh, we had in another paper uh, to show that this kind of pairs with J of this strongly nullipotent type could not exist in dimension eight. Uh, at this point, we do not know if this is something specific of this dimension or uh, if it's something more, I mean, we do not know what happens in dimension 12. I mean, if we have a complex, uh, nipotent algebra with the strongly nonlipotent complex structure in dimension eight, we do not know if one it can admit the complex symplectic structure of not. I mean, it's something we are still thinking about. So this would be the first method to try to construct complex symplectic structures in higher dimensions. The second method, instead of uh, doing some kind of uh, reducing the dimension and then go back again, uh, we decided to study complex symplectic structures on a special kind of solvable Lie algebra called almost abelian. So um, a non-abelian Lie algebra is called almost abelian if it contains a codimension one abelian subalgebra. But applying some results, one can check that this is equivalent to your Lie algebra of a codimension one abelian ideal. And indeed, when your Lie algebra has a codimension one abelian ideal, two things can happen. Either your Lie algebra has more than one codimension one abelian ideal, in, and in such case, your algebra is isomorphic to a direct sum of R something and the three dimensional Heisenberg algebra. And, or if your Lie algebra has a unique codimension one abelian ideal, then it is a semi direct product of your big a billion ideal and something which is outside ideal. So essentially the good point about almost a billion Lie algebras is that uh, all the information of your Lie algebra is fully determined by this bracket, essentially the bracket of the element which is outside of the a billion ideal. And uh, almost a billion uh, Lie algebras are solvable. And indeed, they are nilpotent if and only if the this adjoint is nilpotent. So, uh, first of all, let me say that complex structures on almost abelian ideals have been previously studied. And if we put in blue the abelian part, then it was shown that if you take the element outside your abelian ideal, then the image and your complex structure should be inside the ideal. And then we can consider this set in blue, which would be G invariant. And then the neck increase condition is equivalent to having a uh, uh, bracket and a joint of X of this form here, where this is a block matrix, let's say, where F is inside this group set of and no morphism of the blue part uh, commuted with your complex structure. And then this is a vector and A is just a number. So we did something similar for symplectic structures. The starting point was similar, but then we consider the symplectic orthogonal of the big abelian ideal. And we observed that this Orthogonal was one dimensional, hence isotropic. So it was contained in its, in its orthogonal, which was in turn U. So we could perform the same process as before and consider the quotient algebra, which was a vector space is similar to the complement of this space inside of U, which would be the yellow part, with an induced symplectic structure. And then we realized that. The symplectic form was closed, if and only if the adjoint of X had this form here. Again, using block matrices, F, this F is a 
something similar. I mean, it is defined on the yellow part and satisfying some relation with respect to the induced symplectic form. Then we have some other terms. So to construct, construct complex symplectic structures on almost abelian algebras, the, the idea was to make these diagrams fit. And indeed, we saw that they fit quite well. We allow us to define this green part. And then this green part splits into the, I mean, the, the, the ideal U, sorry, splits into the green part, the symplectic orthogonal, the image of the symplectic orthogonal, and something generated by this term here. It was possible to take a generator of the, the orthogonal with this condition. And then the initial triple splits into two triples. And each of them is a complex symplectic vector space, where B, this, this part here, is just given by the terms in, in white inside the diagram. And uh, this part here would be the part in green. And well, these two parts behave well with well, the symplectic structure and the complex structure. Okay. So in this sense, that's why I saw that the two diagrams agree in a good way. And the, uh, the fact that this pair is a complex symplectic structure is equivalent of having this, uh, again, block, uh, block a structure on the adjoint of X. But, well, thanks to this structure, uh, observe that this, the part in clean is in fact something abelian. So when you put the complex structure and the symplectic structure, you can do it in such a way that they take the canonical form. But then put in the, the other parts, I mean, the, this part here and using this, you can check that you have something like that where the complex structure on the full the algebra is of this type and same with the symplectic structure. And applying some previous results about this kind of structures, this kind of matrices actually, we are able to see that any foreign dimensional triple this type is isomorphic as a complex symplectic Lie algebra to something like this with this F that gives you the semi-direct product is one of the following, so one of the following types. And indeed, it is possible to determine whether a, an almost abelian uh, Lie algebra admits a complex symplectic structure by counting the Jordan blocks of this uh, semi-direct product. Uh, indeed, we were able to see that the, this complex, structure, complex symplectic structure was unique in some cases, but for all the cases, we got to find different non-equivalent complex symplectic structures. So uh, just some final remarks. Uh, first of all, construct to, constructing geometric structures on smooth manifolds is in general not easy. But, it is possible to simplify this construction if one focus on special kind of manifolds, course of manifolds, where some of these constructions can be performed perform at the level of the Lie algebra of the Lie group. And these kind of structures are called invariant structures. In this talk, we have constructed complex symplectic structures on foreign dimensional Lie algebras. And this kind of geometric structures are given by a complex structure, a symplectic structure, satisfying some condition between them. In particular, we need that the complex structure is symmetric with respect to the symplectic structure. This complex symplectic structure were totally classified for real dimensional form, but the techniques cannot be reproducing higher dimensions. And that's why we developed 
to new approaches. One of them was this complex symplectic reduction and oxidation that allow us to control the eight dimensional case in the nilpotent case, the nilpotent Lie algebras. And the second approach was to study this complex symplectic structures on a special type of algebras called almost abelian, which are two-step solvable Lie algebras. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments about this talk? Um, Adela, can I ask a couple of questions? So my first question, you see in, in dimension four, right? There were very few of the uh, complex uh, symplectic structures, right? I mean, you just listed all of them, right? So, yeah. so do, do, you, do you have any conjectures what happens in the higher dimension? I mean, it seems like they're not gonna be that many, right? In the higher dimension or... Mm. I'm not sure because in the end, in the for the eight-dimensional nilpotent case that we constructed all the oxidation data, in fact, it was difficult to find all the oxidation data because it was mm, there were like more structures than we expected. I mean, at the beginning we thought that maybe there were very few, but it seems that they are more common than. Mm -hmm. but by the way, uh, do you know there is this 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 famous structures, hyperkiller structures, right? Where you have this. Uh, so do, do you think it's sort of reasonable to look at the like solvable algebras with this hyperkiller structure? Actually, in the in the same paper where we classify this four dimensional case, what we uh -huh. did was consider also um, high. Hypersymplectic, hypersymplectic. They are kind of, I mean, they are, for instance, these systems do, the, do not need to be hyperkeller. I mean, because for instance, in the nil manifolds, they are not hyperkeller because they are only the yeah. tori are keller. But there are some triples called, for instance, hypercomplex or uh, hypersymplectic. Where you have, like, for instance, three complex structures or three symplectic structures, and you can find them on the nilpotent in the nilpotent case or in some solvable cases too. Yeah, yeah. So in mm -hmm. fact, there is some. We did some construction to find what we call hyper hyper symplectic. Yeah. So this is in this uh, this paper, right? This this joint paper in twenty twenty one, right? Yeah. Bazonia. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll take a look. Okay, are there any other questions, comments? Um, I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Adela, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, I'm not seeing you, but... <laughs> I have lost some details. Have you said that all uh, solvable uh, Lie algebras of dimension um, multiple of four are classified? No, no, no. Uh, By uh, uh, per, per of 63 or something like that. Ah, the four dimensional case. Four dimensional case. Uh, yes. Only four. But, uh, all, all solvable Lie algebras of dimension. Ah, four. Ah, oh, four, it's not yeah, multiple four. of four. No, 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 no. <laughs> ah, fine. Uh, then, um, I will tell you a family of solvable Lie algebras I oh, have yeah. in four, uh, for talking with you about what happens with, um, if it's possible. In the oh, maybe they are in dimension four? Maybe Multiple of four, not Multiple. four, oh, uh, 28. Oh, 28. <laughs> no, but, but, but um, um, it works by blocks. So perhaps it's useful for you. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, because it it's multiple of four, but um, each block or dimension four has the same behavior. Well, oh, okay. Well, I I, I, like I read I read bad. I understood that all solvable. I, I thought, oh, when <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I had no idea. No, sorry. Mm. It would be nice, but I think it. That would be different. Well, no, nice. It's better to 
to have a lot of things to discover. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Uh, hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi? Yes, yes, okay. go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, Adela. My name is Rosa from Extremadura. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your talk. I found I found it really interesting. Well, um, you. Um, you talk about um, uh, the almost abelian algebras, and mm. you have construct. What have you obtained from this type of algebras exactly? Uh, mm. um, almost abelian. I mean, we reduce. You have you use the the methods to obtain. Yeah, like the two two parts. One fully abelian with a, a classical, let's say, canonical complex structure and canonical symplectic form, which is nice because it's just one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to take care of the the other the, part. The the thing is the the most important nilpotent algebra is the filiform one. The, and the mm. model Philly for one is of this type, is almost abelian. We have yeah. a very big uh, subalgebra of codimension one, abelian one. So maybe if you work with model Philly form, you can obtain model Philly form with these extensions. Maybe, I don't know if a, mm. any dimensions, I don't know. But I don't know. maybe. I know work. that, for instance, filiform Lie algebras do not admit complex structures. But the model filiform but one? Model filiform? I, I don't know. I've never. The model filiform is almost abelian. The no, model okay. filiform only. The simplest no. one. Okay. okay. I don't know that one. <laughs> I know it. I know it very well. So, another, another question. Um, have you thought of, or is anyone has ever thought the idea of doing every, uh, exactly this thing, but for super algebras? Instead uh, of algebras, super algebras. I've never worked in super algebras, but I have heard some constructions on uh, symplectic um, forms of super Lie algebra. So maybe oh, it, it's. I, 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 it happens that I have recently worked with. A quadratic symplectic Lie super algebras. And also it happens that for, I don't know if you know, but for algebras, quadratic symplectic uh, are always nilpotent, not solvable, nilpotent. Oh. Because the, the equivalence of symplectic is in this case, in this particular case, is the same as if you have an invertible derivation. And if you have an invertible derivation, it's not solvable, it's nilpotent. So your talk reminds me a lot of this, <laughs> of these quadratic symplectic structures because it happens that I have worked recently with superalgebras and we have proved the same. We have proved that oh. for symplectic quadratic superalgebras also they are nilpotent, non-solvable. So and also with I have worked with double extensions. You have mentioned it, mm -hmm. and with double extensions, if you choose a particular case of algebras inside like almost a billion model feeling for but you have to work with a very specific type and if you use a method maybe you can obtain a very large examples in very high dimensions of whatever you want it's an idea okay so <laughs> no, no. yeah in the paper with the almost a billion we also did something with uh, these extensions this is the, like yes, a, I have worked with yeah. this, uh, and we have worked with a very particular case with the old part of the super algebra. And using double extensions, we obtain uh, another examples exactly with this same type of old part in the super algebra. So it's better to work with a particular case of algebra and use a method and obtain another particular case, but for but for higher dimension in this in double extensions i mean I but i don't know it's a, it, all the ideas okay so <laughs> thank you thanks, thanks a lot okay thank you very much if there is no other questions probably we should uh, thank our speaker again <laughs> okay. okay thank you thank you okay bye everyone Muchas gracias, Adela, que se te entiende maravilloso. Es 